All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, 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 welcome to a brand new episode of Student of the Gun Radio. Yes, indeed. Congratulations uh, for you on making that excellent decision, and you are going to be glad that you are here. Yes, you're going to be glad that you showed up today. Concealed carrier stops Texas mall shooting, not makes a small attack, Texas mall attack. I bet you didn't hear about this on your local radio station or your news station because they don't want you to know about that. When a good guy stops a bad guy, they're like, we don't care. That doesn't part. That doesn't meet the agenda. We, we, we need people to, we need people to die so that we can scare them so that you can surrender your guns. Because remember, you need to be disarmed before you're fighting over food. That is a thing. Continued resilience with our buddies Scott and Todd. We brought them back to see if we could offend you and see if whom, who we could offend or whom it is that we could offend. We've got a dirt coat finished firearm discussion, a Brownells bullet point, and of course, we're going to talk about the uh, the Texas good guy with a gun during the homeroom because that's all about being dangerous on demand, right? Yeah, you knew that. All right, it's time for the uh, super cool introductory music, and we're going to get started. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics, because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping owner, Zach Martin. Now, give it up to your beloved host, the Pin Pan of America, Professor Paul Martin. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It was not a job that I was looking for, but it's a job that I accepted because I knew that America needed me to do the job. All right. Yes. So uh, it was it three weeks ago. It was three, tres weeks ago that uh, we had our friends uh, Scott and uh, Todd on from the Growing Resilience podcast. We talked a lot about uh, growing resilience, about self-sufficiency or Todd doesn't like self-sufficiency because he thinks it's a misnomer. But um, when we use the term self-sufficiency, we basically are trying to remind people that you don't have to be uh, beholden to the state. You should not have the mindset that it's somebody else's job to feed you and clothe you and so on and so forth. So we don't want to you know, go too far back in that. But anyway, let's go ahead and get right up to the right up to the Duracoke finished firearm of the day. All right. My question for you is, what is the color of victory? Pink. Pink. Mm. What is the color of victory? Uh, I, I, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm. All right. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah, you did that. Remember, this is a family-friendly show. That's, that it is. I didn't it's say anything. It's a family-friendly show. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. No. Um, no, it's it's interesting to me to, that ha- that people will have um, debates or arguments or they want to have arguments about uh, the color of guns and how guns shouldn't be a certain color or they should be a certain color. Like, you know, it's an inanimate object, right? Yeah. You know that it can't do anything on its own of its own volition, right? Yeah. Uh, and that painting it one color or another if if you color a gun black white red orange green blue purple whatever it doesn't make it any more dangerous and doesn't make it any less dangerous but what is the color of victory no well, i like to think that uh, that uh, you know olive drab green perhaps is the color of victory that's the one that we embraced uh, we embraced the olive drab green during world war 2 and i guess we won that one is that the last one that we like? Well, no, we won the. We kind of did. We kind of won the Gulf War, the first war. We won the first one, and then we surrendered in the second. So there's that. But what is the color of victory? You can. Dis- the great thing about being an American is you can decide for yourself. Yeah, 
I just gave you permission to make that decision for yourself. Now you can get slightly darker black or World War II olive drab green, or you can get coyote brown or flat dark earth or whatever you want to do, man. You're an American. You're an American. If you want to learn how to do a coat like a pro, uh, I suggest that you follow the link. It's in the show notes. Go to Duracoat University, and uh, you will learn how to Duracoat like a pro, and you can be that guy in your group of friends. You can be that guy in your city, your community, your neighborhood that can be relied upon to put a fantastic Duracoat finish on shotguns, rifles, pistols, anything. Anything you want, man. I was actually uh, had a situation where Duracoat, is is going to in the very near future come into play i had a uh, i picked up a nail in my truck tire and so i was i had to put the spare on but it was it was good it was it was okay i mean it, nobody wants to have a flat tire and nobody wants to have to put a spare on but if you do you want to have all the stuff right so i had prepped myself so that i had everything i needed to do that and I was able to change the tire in 10 minutes uh, or so. And uh, But I pulled out. And if you guys are truck drivers, if you have a truck, where does the spare go on the truck? Well, unless unless you just like using up some of your extra bed space for a tire, it goes underneath, right? I put mine on the roof. Yeah, but here's on the roof. I put mine on the roof like they do in Africa. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, where does your spare tire rim live? It lives under the truck, right? And uh, I pulled my spare off and I put it on the truck and it looks like, mm -hmm. like, oops, this is still the public one. It looks bad. It's rusted. It's got rust marks on it and all over the, and I looked at that and I thought, mm, okay. So once I get the tire situation fixed, that fi fixed, what we need to do is we need to sandblast that rim and I just need to go ahead and this we you speak what, of. Who is this we you speak of? We need to sandblast that rim and uh, put some Duracoat on that sucker, call it good, and move on with their lives. Yeah. So that was that's what I'd be thinking. So if you want to Duracoat things, you can Duracoat guns, you know, shotguns, rifles, pistols, but you can Duracoat the rim, your truck rims if you want to. Just make sure you're not going to drive it for two weeks. Yeah, just prep them, you know, prep it. Uh, and once once I do that, you know, once I once I sandblast and and Duracoat the rim, I'll just leave it, you know, and we'll put it on the truck, and we'll be on the truck going. So, <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. So uh, if you want to do that, get your butts over to DuracoatFirearmFinishes dot com. Tell them Student of the Gun sent you, and you can Duracoat whatever you want because you're an American, right? Uh, that's right. Oh. Uh, Hi, it says, learn about being a first-time gun buyer at highpointfirearms.com. High-pointfirearms.com. Did you put that note in there about learn how to be a first-time, uh, uh, being a first-time gun owner? Who put that in there? I did. Zach did. Good job, Zach. All right. Please elucidate. You can go to high-pointfirearms.com. And then you can scroll down a little bit. We'll put a direct link in the show notes for you so you can get them directly from there. But you it says first time gun buyer. Ah, you no know one. Learn the basics. Get questions answered here. Ah, it's a hyperlink. Yes. And it's first time gun com is the link for you. And it gives you all the information you need. That is that is very interesting because I think someone who looks a lot like us has, has a thing called first time gun owner. No, no. My first gun. Oh, my first gun. Yeah, my first gun. Uh, yeah, we did a thing called My First Gun. Uh, a long time ago. A while ago, yeah. My first gun. Uh, it, it sounds like a children's toy. <laughs> it's like the like when you when you buy a guitar amplifier kit when they, they sell you the everything you need to start playing. And it's just a little guy. It's the baby's first amplifier. <laughs> it's myfirstamp.com <laughs> myfirstgun.com so there you go uh thank you very much to high point for providing that and it's a you know a lot of us we we've been when you do things for so long you just assume that everybody knows you know you, you assume that everybody knows the answers to the questions that you know 
people say, well, you know, what's the difference between this or that? And, and you make, you make kind of the face. I know I make the face. I'm like, uh, how do you not know that? But not everybody does. So welcome to the gun community. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Get your head, get your heads right. Yes. Get your heads right. All right. Uh, Jukesy, J U X X I dot com. And, uh, the, the, the new hotness on Juxy.com, or at least the student of the gun channel on Juxy.com, is the uh, ARX100 video. Should they have discontinued it? Do you think they should have? I don't know. Well, so here's what they didn't do. They didn't discontinue the parent rifle, which is the ARX160, which is the one that the Italian Army is using. Uh, and to, to tell you guys the truth, you know, we... I the, want you to lie to me. No, okay, yeah, they'll lie to you. The, but there are so many features on that gun that if you look at the features and then you compare the look at the price tag, you're like, price tag's really not that much for all the features you get. And you know the the ability to change it with the tip of a you just you take the tip of a five five six cartridge and you punch a recessed button they recessed the button on purpose so that it wouldn't get accidentally bumped you punch the recessed button with the tip of a cartridge and it changes the ejection side left to right right to left with the tip of a cartridge that's voodoo that's magic you're like what how can that possibly be but you because you're like well on an ar the extractor and, and you know like it's like no they did it and it works and it's super simple. You can change the charging handle from left to right without any tools. Just lock the bolt open, follow the instructions, push it over. I prefer to have external tools that I need yeah. to have with me. Yeah. No screwdrivers, no wrenches, nothing. Just, you know, they did that. See, the original gun they did, they designed for army privates. See, that's the thing. That's the litmus test. Hmm. Can can an 18 year old conscript figure out how to do this? Can the privates touch it? Yeah. Can the can the private, the PFC figure out how to do this? Because if they can't, it's probably not a good idea. It's probably not a good tool for the military. Uh, yeah, it's just it. I, I know it's sad. You're like, why are you talking about stuff that we can't have? Well, I mean, if you go to gun broker, uh, you know, if you go to gun ebay.com, you can still buy them. They're still out there. They exist. You know, they made a lot of them and they're out there in the world. You just can't go to your dealer and order one, you know, but maybe who knows, maybe if enough people, if the demand is there, you know, we're, we live in a capitalist, you know, market. If the demand is there, maybe they'll buy them. The, and the interesting thing about that gun, and I didn't even know this till I talked to the people at Beretta was that, they did the tooling and the workup. Everything's in Tennessee. So those guns, the, you know, they're like, well, Brothers is an Italian company, and I never buy anything from an Italian company or a foreign company. It's like, yeah, but they make it. It's actually Americans that make it. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. That, but if you want to see me out in the snow, uh, tromping around the snow, shooting my rifle. Uh, you can go to juxxi.com, juxy.com, and uh, follow us and do that. You should do that. All right. Moving on. It's time for new listeners to close their mouths, open up both of their ears, and listen just a little bit louder. Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. Yes, indeed. All right. Without further ado, what we're going to do is we're going to bounce right over to the Brownells bullet points section. All 
All right, bing, bang, boom. Uh, Brownells Bullet Points brought to you by Brownells. And we got two things. Number one, today, as you're listening to this, if you're listening to it on Wednesday when it releases to the public, it is 2-22-23. Boom. And that is Second Amendment Appreciation Day. This is the second annual Brownells-sponsored Second Amendment Appreciation Day. So take advantage of that. We talked about it last week, and we're going to remind you about it today. And uh, this is also when I tell you, if you have not been to the Brownells website lately, you should probably go there because it's going to look a little bit different to you. Oh, yeah. So if you've ever gone to the Brownells website and said, I wish they would update this thing, it's old. Well, they did. And it's to be fair. Yeah. No, but not one, not one of you guys. People say, oh, you know, that company, they should just redo their website. Like, really? Are you going to uh, write them a check for $100,000 to redo their massive website? Mm -hmm. When you're a company the size of Brownells, it's not like doing your homepage for your dog, you know. When you, any e-commerce is, just trust me on this one, I've done many, many e-commerce sites. And the bigger, the more SKUs you have, the more difficult it is to do a transfer of any sort. Yeah. And they've got SKUs galore. Let me tell you. They've got SKUs coming out of their ears. Was it like 873,000 SKUs or something like that? Yeah, I don't know. That's shopkeeper units for you people who don't speak the lingity. Shopkeeper units. Oh, so that means they got a lot of products. That's what that means. It means they got a lot of products. We got a lot of stuff in stock. Uh, Do I need to tell you that now is the time to buy your ammunition? Do I need to tell you now is the time to buy the pieces, parts, and components? Do I need to tell you that? This is when you shake your head and you say, no, you don't need to tell me that. Okay, good. You don't need to tell me that, Paul. And you, and you, now, somebody, you know, somebody just did. They just went to the website and they're like, ah, oh, they got that, but I don't want to, I don't want to pay that much for that ammo. Okay. Then don't. But here's the dealio, Jack. Thanks to the inflation created by our criminal government, uh, the price of ammunition reflects the, well, the value of the American dollar, which is dropping dramatically all the time. So it's not going to go back down to where it was in 2018, 2019. You're waiting for 19 cents a shot, nine millimeter. Well, have a seat and keep waiting, buddy. But it's not going to happen. So if you need ammo, if you need pieces and parts and so forth, the time to get them is now. Yes, indeed. So go over to the brand new Brownells website. Check them out. Tell them the student of the gun sent you, and you'd be a happy camper. How's that sound? Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. And, and get out today and celebrate your Second Amendment rights. Go out and celebrate the Second Amendment. Take someone new shooting, go shooting. You know, do whatever you got to do. All right. All right. Uh, now it's time for me to be quiet. Zach has got a, uh, he's got a little, he's got a gift to give you. So pay attention. He's about to give you a gift. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the pimp hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeed you do. And if you go over to ShopSOTG.com right now, today, and that's even if you're listening live, you will find that the uh, our firearms fitness uh product on our store is currently at a nice little discount because winter is coming to an end and it's about time to get ready to go do some training, go do some gun school. So I figured why not, you know, this will be perfect to sharpen your brain, kind of shake off some of those cobwebs from being holed up all, all winter. So yeah, shop us at TG.com. The firearms fitness is a nice little discount for you. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Zachary, for that. Thank you very much. Or you'd be like me, and you could just put on extra layers and go out and play in the snow, which is what I've, I've been doing. Putting on my snowshoes. Uh, all right, it is time for us to pop on over to the 
uh, Crossbreed Holsters Home Room. It's called the Student of the Gun Home Room. It's brought to you by our good buddies at Crossbreed Holsters, and we do it every week. All right, I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again for the people in the back that didn't hear it the first time. Uh, if you go to CrossFreeHolsters.com and you use the promotional code SOTG, you're going to save money on a fantastic made in America, high quality made in America by Americans. It's all made in America by Americans in Missouri, by the way. So it's in free America and uh, you're going to get that. And if you would uh, let them know the student of the gun sent you, I would truly appreciate that because it's very important. That's very important. All right. Uh, we always talk about uh, being dangerous on demand, and we like to give examples of why you should be dangerous on demand. And today is the perfect example of why you should be dangerous on demand. And it, uh, the source, there's many sources out there, but this one is from dailywire.com. I'm going to read the title, and Jared's going to give us the deets. This just happened. Uh, was Well, the Dateline is February 18th, so it's pretty recent. Texas mall shooting suspect stopped by citizen with gun, say the police. Police in Texas said this week that 16-year-old suspected shooting the uh, suspected thesis. of shooting three people at an El Paso mall was shot by a citizen who was legally carrying a firearm at the mall. Hmm. The suspect, a Hispanic male, is accused of killing 17-year-old uh, Angelis Zargon Zaragoza, Zaragoza. Yeah. and wounding two others, a 20 year old Hispanic male and a 17 year old Hispanic male. According to police, the alleged shooter was shot by 32 year old Emmanuel Duran as he fled the scene. You know, what's interesting to me that they they didn't give the name of the of the killer. They're protecting the identity of the murderer. And. They told us who the armed citizen was. Well, thank thank goodness that they're protecting the identity of the murderer. Thank goodness for that. It says, as soon as the shooting ended, the 16-year-old suspect began to run, and it was pointing the gun toward the direction of bystanders, including 32-year-old Emmanuel Duran, a licensed concealed carry holder. As the suspect ran towards Duran and bystanders, Duran drew his handgun and shot the suspect. That was a quote from the El Paso Police Department. How you like me now? After Duran shot the suspect, he and an off-duty police officer rendered aid to him, quote-unquote, uh, before he was taken into police custody and transported to the hospital where he was in stable condition. Duran, who was listed as a victim in the incident, has been cooperating with police, according to investigators. The shooting took place Wednesday evening at the Cello Vista Mall in El Paso. Police said that the violence was triggered after a confrontation between two groups at the food court. Hmm. Interesting. Police Sergeant Robert Gomez said that the suspect would likely be charged with murder. One, did he kill somebody? Likely. Yeah. Likely be charged with murder. One person is dead, so that the so the likely charge will be murder. It's not official, but that would be the appropriate charge. What are they going to charge him with otherwise? Jaywalking? Manslaughter? I don't know. I mean, what's... I'm not a not that smart of a person to know these things so don't ask me and the other suspects that were injured by gunfire the appropriate charge would be aggravated assault which we just discussed this or attempted murder yeah you know? but again until the official until they are officially charged he's just a suspect well let's make sure that we protect the the this poor innocent Gomez said that the incident was disturbing and the gun used in the killing was stolen. No you mean the 16 year old didn't go into the store and fill out a 4473 and buy it? It is always concerning when a 16 year old has a stolen handgun and fires a weapon inside of a crowded mall. It's very concerning. It's very disturbing, actually. Mm. Another is there. Hi, there's a baby. You want to come say hello? Hello, beautiful. Are you excited? We have a special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special guest in the studio. Hello. Say hello into the microphone. Mm -hmm. 
microphones. We do have new microphones. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Ruth. Please do. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Love you. A special guest today. Her name is Ruth. Oh, she's going to oh, say hi, she's going, hi, baby. I love you. All right. Uh, so it's concerning. They say. It's concerning. So. It's disturbing. <laughs> so another shooter at the mall was stopped by a citizen with a gun when a 22 year old uh, Elijah Dickon. Wait, oh, is this the another shooter at a mall? Yeah. This, so this is OK. That's what I thought. Yeah. Another shooter at a mall was stopped by a citizen when they with a gun when a 22 year old Elijah Dickon shot a man who had attempted to shoot up on Indian Indiana Mall. That's what I was an Indian mall. Yeah, an Indian mall. That's that's what I was trying to. I was like, that name sounds familiar. An oh, mall. because it is. Dickon, who used a nine millimeter Glock pistol, fired off ten rounds, hitting the shooter eight times in the span of only fifteen seconds, and from a distance of about forty yards away. Yeah, he foiled another one of the FBI slash NSA uh, hit jobs to try and get us to uh, be embarrassed. How do you disarm a uh, an armed society? Ignorance, distraction, guilt. Ignorance, distraction, and guilt. And uh, when you stage mass murders, then and you have your sycophant media go out and nonstop push those murders, then uh, what you get is you get guilt, and you get people weak. They, you get people to be weak-minded and willing to go along with, quote, reasonable gun control. But what good does reasonable gun control do you when you have a 16-year-old in possession of a stolen gun shooting up a mall? Are 16-year-olds are allowed to murder people, or is that against the law? Pretty sure it's against the law. Are 16-year-olds allowed to possess stolen guns, or is that against the law? So we have a 16-year-old piece of human uh, garbage here who was in possession of a stolen gun, who didn't care that they committed murder, wasn't stopped by the fact that murder is illegal in Texas. Last time I checked, murder was illegal in Texas. And it's interesting because at the very beginning, Jared and I, we were talking about the, uh, or was it, or was it, um, no, it was on the, it was in our discussion with Scott and Todd. Uh, in the days of future past about how this weekend I found myself in a shopping mall. And what was interesting to me while I was in that shopping mall was that there was in one of, it wasn't at the, the, uh, the opening entrance to the mall. There wasn't a sign at the entrance to the mall, yeah. but one of the businesses inside of the mall had a big, they had a big no sign. You know, they had the great big placard with all the, the no symbols. You're not allowed to do this. Not allowed to do it. And it said no alcohol, no, this, no, that. And then it said no weapons or firearms, um, no weapons allowed. And I was like, well, I guess I can't come in here because I am a weapon. <laughs> but to, so I thought that was interesting. And then, of course, I thought, well, it's a good thing that sign is there because that will definitely prevent 16 year old felons and NSA FBI operatives from coming in and committing mass murder because there's a sign there. Right. Oh, that's right. It doesn't work like that. Mm. So the uh, the moral of the story is this. The only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun and anyone who tells you any different is a scumbag they're a liar they're a criminal and they want you to be disarmed so you need to be dangerous on demand regardless regardless of signs and placards and feelings and and uh, shame campaigns put on by your criminal government all right the next thing we're going to do is we're going to welcome our friends scott and Todd from the Growing Resilience podcast. We had him on a few weeks ago. Talked a lot, a lot of stuff. We had a lot, many, many, many questions that came in after we had them on. So we thought, what the heck? Let's bring them on again. And that's exactly what we did. So uh, the next voices you hear are going to be myself and Jared and Scott and Todd. And those of you that would like to hear the entire interview, we're going to have about half of it here on the show today. And you join getsotg.com and you can get the rest of it tomorrow. Yep. 
All right, we've got Scott and Todd. It's the Scott and Todd Show, 99.7, the Fox in the Morning. Er, 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 er. Woo! <laughs> you know, I always wanted to do that just as a lark. What? Yeah, me too. To do the morning DJ thing, the oh, morning yeah. drive time radio. It's drive time radio. Wake up, Cincinnati. Well, they don't play commercials nowadays, so it would be more enjoyable. Oh, they do commercials during on drive more, time. On drive time, oh, that's, oh, that's here at the station that I listen to. Five oh, o'clock hour, they don't play any commercials. No, that's prime. So that see, as a, a radio ad sales guy, that's prime time. Oh yeah, prime time is mornings and afternoons. Oh, yeah, when people are forced to be in the car, they have to. Yeah, yeah. there's still radio. No, that's there, what there I'm is. saying. Radio still exists, and everyone will <laughs> right. be listening to it, and a commercial will come on. I'm like, boop. You know, sometimes I actually I wonder why some people listen to radio. And then the other day I got in the car and I didn't have any of the accessories the, plugged in to the Jeep. And I was like, oh, this is how people end up listening to the radio. They don't have anything it. else because it just comes how, with the car. It's how my grandpa yeah, did that's it. That's right. <laughs> I miss it. I miss it. Mm-hmm. I really do. You know, there uh, was some there was some crazy stuff on the radio, you know, it's Art Bell, Coast to Coast Radio. You'd be local shows that were nuts. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot about it sucked, you know, cause they would tell us that like, uh, they would tell us that wham was good, you know, and we had to listen <laughs> to that stuff, Wham! But, but there was, uh, there was interesting stuff on the radio way back when, you know, it was no, I was, uh, I, in, in a lot of you guys in the listening audience knows when I was in high school, we had a high school radio station. Uh, WHCK West Holmes Charging Nights WHCK FM 109 uh, is that actually what it was the frog well 109 is nothing it doesn't exist yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, but no we had we actually had it, it was uh, it was a closed circuit basically yeah. it was closed circuit radio you get it there yeah. so uh, yeah but I was a DJ I was a DJ on the high school radio station it was the, the, the school <laughs> The, the school, the class was officially called like broadcasting 101 or something like that. And we had to, uh, we had to do programming and we had to sell ads. We had to go out and sell ads to the local businesses and then write the ads and read the ads unless the local business wrote the ad for us. And then it was even more fun. I bet that was awesome. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And <laughs> What was uh, a 30 second spot on a 109 uh, FM, the voice of uh, Franklin High School? Or yeah, the, the West Holmes, West Holmes, uh, WHCK, West Holmes Charging Nights. That's right. Um, WHCK it was probably like $50 a year. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it was something like that. And we would Sold. we put the money in a kitty, and that, that's what we used to, to pay for our 45 records, our 45s. You, you put the money into a cat? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. put it in there. And, uh, Oh. I would have, I would have bought a spot on there for that fifty bucks yeah. a year. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and I just advertise a, a hangout for teen girls. <laughs> at my home address. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, that's how you get them all there. Oh, uh, that's what I love about yeah, high school girls. I keep getting older, and they stay the same. <laughs> no, that, and then, uh, you know, you just uh, get a, get an acoustic guitar. Mm. Pretty soon, you get a cult. That's right. Got those, got those, uh, got those uh, girl with daddy issues. And you uh, got your acoustic guitar. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was uh, reprimanded for for sarcasm uh, when I was on the. the with, no, I don't. Yeah, believe oh, yeah, that. I was, I, I was I reprimanded for, you? for engaging in sarcasm during the ad reads. <laughs> if you can imagine, you can only imagine. All right, so uh, n- enough fun and frivolity. Since we were here last, uh, we discovered that Scott it has the power to offend. <laughs> <laughs> Did Jared share that with you? Yeah. 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 Well, millennials, ovens, ovens, millennials, you know. But anyway. Uh, should, we, should we talk about the nature of the offense? Because I, I, I have to talk about this. This is interesting to us. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think that if uh, if Scott wants to touch on the nature of the offense, I think that's a great yeah. it's a great way good, to move forward. Pod. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I said on the on the last time that we appeared, uh, I, 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 I quoted you guys might not know this, but I was quoting uh, Pinty Lincola when he says billions must die. He says, uh, you know, we don't have enough uh, 
petrochemicals. We don't have enough in uh, the nitrogen. We don't have enough of anything um, for there to be uh, billions of people teeming on the face of the earth and billions must die. And I think that that's like a thermodynamic and economic certainty that that's tr- that that's true. And uh, so I was quoting him and then I said, well, you know, we'll just we'll fertilize our gardens. Yeah. And the guy thought that I was a pagan jerk for saying that. But, you know, what am I going to I don't. I mean, that's maybe the only way he's ever been useful is as p- compost. Um, but people don't want to hear that kind of talk. No. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he says, you know, Scott, I don't want to hear about uh uh, this was Palestine had just happened. The, the train derailment had just happened. And he and I were talking. He says, I don't want to hear about all this negative stuff. And I said, well, it's not negative or positive. I mean, it happened. The train reality it off is. of the track. Mm-hmm. They leaked. And, uh, and, and that determining that that is positive or negative. Is you making a value judgment. On the nature of a truth, but the truth is just true. And if you find that that the truth uh, bums you out (laughs) or uh, ruins your day, uh, that's local to you. That's your thing. That's the truth. That's what it is. The multiplication tables are what they are. And uh, five times five is 25. And that's not positive or negative. That's just the truth. And uh, I find that people often I'll say something that's just true. And they're outraged. Ah, how can you? Well, yeah, that's because they've been conditioned. They've been conditioned to, to, uh, you know, we, uh, somebody, I, someone said there, I can't remember who it was. It was one of the, one of the pundits. And, and they said, there's no such thing as your truth. We, we, we've, we've, uh, brainwashed our, our imbecile Gen Z's and even some millennials into this, this, I don't know where they got it from, but it's like, speak your truth. It's, uh, this is you know what it is? Truth. It's the life coaches. Yes. The, the written your books truth. Because I've read some books that say that. And I'm like, okay, it does. I don't even know what that means. What, because yeah. truth is truth is truth. Right. And, and the guy said, he goes, there is no such thing as your truth. There is the truth. And it doesn't care about your feelings. Your feelings are immaterial. Uh, to the truth it's like water is wet fire is hot razor blades are sharp and if any of those things bother you that's your problem you said it wrong it's water is life all people are equal and whatever else is on that stupid sign some people contain more nitrogen than others they're not all equal some of them grow better tomatoes uh now we call emotions feelings for a reason Mm mm-hmm because you see, you have the you, you you become aware of the emotion through a physical sensation. That was why we call them feelings. Like you get scared, your face gets hot, your heart rate goes up. You can feel it. It doesn't actually occur as like a thought, or uh, it doesn't occur in your mind. It's actually a physical response, and and, and our feelings tell us something about the world. It's a chemical, but type. they aren't the world. They aren't the world. Right. They're part of our sensorium. They're part of the data that comes at us that tells us we're in danger or that we're fond of that person or that we don't like speaking in public or, or whatever it is. And it, uh, but people um, people don't really know where they end and, and where the world begins. It's it's really a it's a queer thing. Oh, this and, and this confusion began long before uh, Gen Z and millennials. This uh, they had to learn it from somewhere. And Percy this was Shelley and the romantics mm-hmm. of the 1800s. How about that? That would be a great place to start. And then it was even further codified and cleared up and clarified uh, in the 60s with French thinkers, with Derrida and Foucault and postmodernism. And oh, all of a sudden, everything became relative. There was no universal truth. The good, the true, mm-hmm. and the beautiful evaporated into the individual experience, at which point nobody had any footing whatsoever in reality anymore if they decided to follow those teachings. Those French thinkers that you just mentioned, they had some feelings. They did have some feelings. Far, they had some really weird, dirty <laughs> parts. Um, and they I, wanted I, I you wanna, to think they were okay. On the, um, <laughs> I want to comment on the amount of people on Earth. Because okay. one thing that we talk about with our audience is, um, well, actually, it's not really with this audience. It's mostly with Legion of Michael. But mm. uh, there, we we do also a faith-based show. 
those of you that don't know that it's legion of michael.com uh-huh. and one of the one of the rebuttals that i have for people that say that there's only enough earth to support x number of people is well what is that number how do we know that and who are we to decide how much of the natural resources that god put here for us are there to serve an x number of people and not unlimited number of people well and, and what is what is what is human life also you know if everybody lives like yeast and you're yeah. fed like a liquid nutrient replacement thing and you live in a pod you know and we can support 27 billion people but but the quality of life is insect or yeast like you know i mean uh, yeah, so there's a quality of life argument to be made, and then there's a, I hate this word. I hate this word. I hate this word. Sustainability. You know, how long can you do 27 billion people? Yeah. Well, I mean, do, I mean, uh, feed them. Is there a better word? Because I, I use that word a lot. Sustainability? Yeah, do you think there's a better word? Uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, how about thermodynamically and economically feasible? There you go. Okay, uh, there you go. Maybe. Maybe um, it needs a, a little punch here. You need a sing- We need a single word here. Yeah, Your point yeah. Is well yeah we do like a, like uh, second what has a long-term viability. What, what does our plan have? Long-term viability. Is this a viable plan? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you, you know, Scott, it's, it's like, um, I mean, people talk about Africa we can talk about Africa, like, like, Oh, in these countries, there's, there's this mass famine and then they can't feed their kids. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So when animals don't have enough food in their environment to sustain, they have fewer babies, right? It's, it's, it's natural. It, you know, watch a nature show, but when humans don't have enough food or the ability to grow food or produce food or whatever in their environment, what we do is we give them an artificial source at, for a year or two. And when then they have lots of babies and then we say, oh, well, we gave you all that rice, you know, a couple of years ago. So have fun. Bye. Peace out. And they're like, yeah, but now all my kids are starving. Like, well, yeah. What did, what did you think was going to happen? What we've done, and then people say, oh, we don't have enough, you know, well, we've removed actual reality from the world. We've removed consequences and responsibilities from actions. So now actions no longer have any type of consequences. There's no responsibility. So if you decide I'm going to have, I can't grow enough corn, rice, carrots, you know, whatever to support me and my wife, but we're going to have 10 kids. And that those people over there, we're just going to ask them for food. They'll give us the food. We're actually going to get paid for our children. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. When you have a situation where you're giving people, where you're paying people to have kids, you know, look at the United States of America in the 70s and 80s. We literally paid unwed mothers to have children. Not figuratively, we we gave them a benefit. They're like, you know what? You want to have keep having kids out of wedlock? We'll keep giving you money. Now this, oh, I just and how this. do you expect people to correct their behavior or change their behavior or alter their behavior when you poison the well in such a way? So I don't know if we're ever going to talk about homesteading, but go go ahead, Jared. But I have a a bomb to drop in just okay. a minute. Yeah, I will <laughs> shelf my thing because okay. we've got what an hour. Yeah. No, do it. Oh. Uh, before we go any farther, Todd, did you get the PFT book? No, I did not. That would be a Zach issue. The physical fitness test. Yeah. Zach, did you send the PFT book to Todd? I thought I did. Did you, you think you did? <laughs> <laughs> That's a solid no. I'm sorry, Dad, oh. Zach. I didn't, I, I didn't mean to rat you out. <laughs> it he felt like you might have been Todd's just so far... He's in an undisclosed, n- unfindable location that nobody can find. So, all right. Well, then we won't talk. It only that. comes through on occasion when the the planets align just right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, nice but there is a theory, Professor. Yes. R and K theory of uh, reproduction that goes a little something like this. It's been a while since I've made any sort of study about this, so there'll be errors in here maybe, but this is the gist of it, the gist of it. There are certain animals that have a R-style reproductive uh, strategy, like the rabbit. And the rabbit has a large number of kids, 
or, or kits uh, fish lay thousands of eggs, for example, and uh, the and then they hope that one gets past the goalie and makes it to reproductive age and then continues that cycle. And the other the other reproductive strategy is the K reproductive strategy that uh, is practiced mostly in the northern hemisphere in terms of people. And the idea is you have one or two offspring and you sink a large number of calories and resources into that into that offspring uh, in hopes of getting that offspring to uh, uh, to to a reproductive age. Uh, elephants would do this. People, when they're at their best, do this. And uh, um, there's a lot of talk about we pay these people to have uh, uh, children, but. I think that there are a growing number of people among us that practice the R, the R strategy, and they do that regardless of pay, and that is but a, a benefit to the, a, a benefit to them that they would they they'd be having the kids anyway is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Potentially, and if you live in a, a, a an environment with a large number of threats and high mortality, it is the only way that you can. Uh, give greater assurance to those those genetics passing on so animals yeah. will start to do that too any animal will and when it becomes stressed they will start to reproduce more plants will even do this they'll reproduce more quickly and go to seed more quickly in an attempt to try to reproduce when the stress is so high uh that they think that their demise is imminent you, you go out and uh, take a wire brush to your apple tree before bloom set because it says oh no and it makes more makes more fruit uh, but the flip side of that is, is if, if things are too easy, people won't reproduce. You know, if things are too mm-hmm. easy, they turn into pandas. They won't screw to p- save the species. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to I want to start a business as a reproductive coach. Dude, <laughs> dude, <what? laughs> the sweet spot between a rabbit and a panda. You, you know what <laughs> what you need? You need to do a uh, a one or a two hour. What What's the sweet spot for seminars at Fanex, Zach? Uh, I think it's like half a few minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. That's 15 to 20 is a sweet spot for fa- for, for. I have seminars? no idea. You just pull oh, this okay. out of your butt and I have no clue. Well, no, we, we went to uh, <laughs> we went to the local Salt Lake Fan X. Right. And I told Zach, this was like what, last September or something. And I said to Zach, yeah. I said, you know what they need to do for the breakout sessions and the seminars? I said they need to do a how to talk to the opposite sex yeah. seminar. Mm. I wasn't even joking. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, even yeah. joking. Like we've got all these these cosplayers and bless their heart. I have nothing against these kids that want to some of them. I'm all for the are, female ones, you know, are, are, yeah, are very creative. You know, they, 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 they put a lot of time and effort and everything. You know, that's great. But they have no idea how to talk to the opposite sex because they've spent their whole life staring down at a two inch by three inch screen. Uh, and when they encounter them in real life, it's we were in a, co- a coffee shop, donut shop the other day, and I was just sitting at the table and this guy walked in and his attempt to flirt with the donut girl was pathetic. I was sitting over my chair just just feeling the cringe, you know, that's uh, like poor God. guy. Jeez. Hey, at least he had enough courage to try. Right. And he was, and, and then he walked out and I thought, Oh, that's the future of the species right there. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's, not. <laughs> it's the, that's not the future of the species. Yeah. And, and then, then I was in another coffee shop at a different place and a, a male of our species came in and sat down at a table and it, uh, the, this creature was waiting for it to be interviewed for a job. Right. And, uh, and I'm over and minding my business, but paying attention to the world like I always do. And this, this male of our species, I, I would estimate was between the age of 18 and 20, maybe 21 at the most crossed his legs at the knee. Okay. Imagine how you're like, what do you mean? Cross him? At, yeah. Crossed him at the knee and was twirling, his foot and uh, waiting like a pretty while, lady like a pretty lady <laughs> while he was wa- waiting for the manager to come out and interview him for the position and i was like wow i was just trying to figure out how it is possible as a wow. dude to cross your legs at, at the, the knee. knee and then i remembered that people that squat cannot do that 
yeah people that people that don't squat can do that really easily because it's little skinny bird legs yeah. but i can't imagine when i was 18 when i was 18 and 19 and filled with testosterone and all the chemicals i just wanted to fill the space i was in with myself you know what i mean you're out there a pulse spreading that's right i'm like <laughs> i was like man spreading i was like this is where and that's the way the human race is supposed to be you're supposed to be like, you know, when I see these 19 and 20 year olds and they're like, and they're mo-, and like, that's that's how the species survives, because they're supposed to be like that. They're sp- it's like it's like a bull or or a cock rooster or a peacock. You know, they're they're attracting the females by being, you know, they're pluming and so forth. And then you have in our modern world, these men or creatures, these males of our species that are demure and feminine and like like well, ladies you, yeah. it, it's I, i'm convinced that it's always been like this because if you go back and you read it, it has i'm i'm convinced okay. that in the city environment it has always been like this the ratio is just seems to be increasing at least for me because one i grew up in a small town and i didn't have a lot of people like that around because yeah i wasn't in a city two now i live closer to a city in the middle of a city and um yeah, but it's 20 years later now. Yeah, yeah, I know. But what I'm saying is the concentration of people is higher. So you're going to notice more of those things. Because if you read these books right here that you guys can't see that I just pointed at, if you read these things, there's the same thing that we're talking about has been talked about before. So I'm convinced that it's been like this for a long, long time. the percentage is way higher. Okay. It, the, the, there the has been, it happens. happens. It, there's it, also it been a happens. chemical neutering. Right. Yeah. I mean, we have that's one thing that, yeah, human nature, I would I would agree with you, Jared. Human nature has barely budged in many thousands of years. So the old books tell us. But we do live in a new era. We are exposed to chemicals that humans have never been exposed to before. There are endocrine disruptors in just about every piece of plastic that wraps every piece of food that holds the liquid you drink, the meals you consume, that's in the air you breathe, that is in the fuels that you put it, everything, everywhere. There, We are under a constant assault and barrage of chemicals that are changing us at a biophysiological layer. On top of that, we have this new form of media in the digital world where the narrative with a capital N can be shaped faster than we can possibly respond as a human, either psychologically or physically. And as a result, there, I know. So as a result, it's, while I agree, and these things also shock me, I don't see how we could have any other outcome than that. And right now, instead, it's easy to say, oh, these kids these days, what the hell? When I was a young man, I get it too. Like, I was the same way, and I can do the same. But, but I have to remember, too, the world is not the same now as it was you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Things have changed dramatically. And, and yeah, spe- speaking of the world changing dramatically, I was gonna, I was going to say, as somebody who is in the age bracket that we're talking about mm-hmm. that there's also you got to think about there is a large like push to actively discourage what dad's talking about the the, sure. the that's the, the narrative the, that the, i spoke it, of yeah exactly yeah. the manly yeah. man who's out there to you know put out his presence and be a strong masculine existence is actively being shamed so guys like twirly foot guy might have been raised by somebody who actively shunned or discouraged him from doing that. Oh, they, they encourage that, that demure behavior. They encourage that demure behavior. There's an expression for it. We have toxic masculinity, right? We don't hear Uh about toxic fem there and, but there's no toxic femininity. Mm -hmm. So how is it that this can be this one sided and you know, the the unharmonious, I, it seems that it is. The, the you know what what is it to be a man what is it to be a woman instead it's you attack these ideals and then you leave people with nothing to hold on to and nothing to actually uh act as guides for who they are and who they can become do you know what the pinnacle of being a man and a woman is what jared separately but at the same time being resilient enough to support your family and grow your own food and produce everything that you need to produce for yourself. That was slick. 
<laughs> that's a professional voice. Uh, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah. yeah, you got. Yeah, uh, Jared said he wanted to talk about like finding land or what to look for or something. Yeah, so I, I, I wanted what to you continue want to our discussion that mm -hmm. we had uh, we had come up on before, and we can go off the rails a little bit during this discussion. I think people enjoy that. They well, do for sure, but I do want to make sure that we sprinkle in a little bit about the growing resilience in here as well, because it's important, you. and we've been talking <laughs> about it in a different manner mm -hmm. for a decade, a little over a decade. So uh, since we last spoke, since we had these two gentlemen on here before, Todd mm. and I, Todd, and myself and my wife had a call. It was our introductory call uh, to for he's helping us find a piece of land. And um, what I learned in that process through his questionnaire and the call itself was I know what I want the end goal to be, but I don't know how to get there. Right. There's so many options. There's so many things that you can do with land. And for somebody like me who has an introductory level of knowledge, it's like, it seems like there's so many possibilities. So that's why I'm, I'm working with Todd because he would be somebody that has a, a master level, expert level knowledge on this thing. He's been doing it for a long time. So he can say, well, those are all great ideas, but here's the reality of the situation. If you want to have a cow or two cows and some horses, then you're going to need a lot more land than if you don't, obviously, right? Um, but you, you don't know how much that really is until you, you talk about it. And here in the West, for instance, one of the things that we talked about on the call, and I'll let you go in a little bit more in depth on this, Todd, is mm. the amount of uh, the nourishment that the animals the need. The growing season. Yeah, the growing season is one, but then the nourishment that the animals need. It's like if you have a shorter growing season, then you have a shorter season to feed the animals from the earth as well. Uh, Todd, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, that that part of the conversation in particular. Uh, just yeah, start there and go wherever you want to go. Sure. Um, so when we were talking, and as you mentioned, uh, having a getting a couple of cows and uh, a, a horse or two, and what that means, the idea sounds great, and it does. I mean, it's there's there's a lot to be said for cows, horses. That's a, that's a personal thing. I'm not, I'm not much of a horse guy personally, but I can understand why people have an attraction to them. But something to consider is that when you have a large animal, a large animal requires a lot of food. Even a small animal requires a lot of food. Feed, feed is getting much more expensive. Um, I was paying oh, three years ago. Hay was about $40 a ton. Um, and it was a little more than that. I think it was $70 a ton. It's now 300 a ton. Uh, when you have, and a ton is one of those round um, bales that you see, the the smaller of the round bales as opposed to the square bales. Marshmallows hay. from an airport. Yeah. There square you go. bales are for horses, round bales are for cattle. There you go. Um, so one of those is a thousand pounds. So that's $150 per roll. Um, Scott can speak to this too. He is uh, a, a new cattleman with a small herd and he is discovering how much hay it takes to keep these animals going. Uh, and what you need to consider is, okay, this animal is only, it needs to, a, a, you have to have land that can provide for it during the growing season. The further North you go, that growing season gets shorter. Uh, it might, it's more intense because you have more light, but there is a, a shorter season in which things will grow. If you live in arid regions, that will also shrink your growing season, especially if you don't have irrigation, then it gets even smaller. Uh, so there are a lot of different factors that can play into your decision making. All of a sudden, when you have cattle and you can only put them on grass that you can provide for 10 weeks out of the year, 15 weeks. Well, then that means the rest of the time you need to have hay put away for them and you need to feed them the rest of the year. And all of a sudden, which seemed like a really good idea of having cows in the land, like yeah, milking them and making products from that milk and cream or eventually slaughtering them and filling your freezer. Well, that might look a little different when all of a sudden you're realizing you're going to pay several thousand dollars per year per animal for hay along with the structure, along with the machine to move the hay, because you can't pick up a thousand pound bale. You need to have a tractor to do it. Uh, you. <laughs> or that could be a goal. Eventually, if you can move that thousand pound bale, you've got six months in which you can do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's, you know, the, you have to, you have to, these ideas, they can, 
it's easy to dream for all of us. And that's wonderful because that's where the these ideas come from originally. This is where we get the motivation to make a change in our life and to step out and do something new is we do have a dream. We have something that is not realized yet. But in the exploration of that, the process needs to be a returning to what is, and this comes back actually beginning of this podcast, what is real, right? What is the truth here? Here is what I want, but as it turns out, reality doesn't quite match what I want. Okay, now I need to look at this. What do I need? And I like to start with need first and work my way up into wants, or they can come together, however you want to visualize this, but they, they, you need to find the overlaps between those. And the overlap is going to be the sweet spot for the individual or the family, the couple, whatever it is, trying to find a new place and, uh, and create this life that they want to live. Yeah. Our process of thinking is, is so similar and I'm, I'm very grateful for that because what we, like what I was thinking in my head was we're going to start with the the minimum effective dose if that's what you want to call it right mm -hmm. but the the end goal i want to be this thing well we can start with a quarter of that and get it going and then build into that end goal and one of the things that i had previously i was considering was making sure the land that i buy is butt up against blm or state land because that essentially extends the the uh the undeveloped area into whatever you know mm -hmm. into however many acres it's going to be but then todd's like I, I don't even think i mentioned that on the call but he said something like well if you want to go in stages then you need to make sure that the land around you is going to be purchasable mm -hmm. because you've got to if you want to start small and then grow into it or buy the piece of land and then just build what you need now and then build into that build into the end goal then you need to make sure that you're obviously going to need to have enough land in the end right well, butting up against BLM or state land is not a good idea if you want to be able to, to expand your land or being landlocked in between other. Ah, but you can, depending on which state you live in. Like if there's no like if there is no uh, uranium on the your local BLM land, people talk about, you know, in Wyoming. Oh, yeah. I mentioned BLM land and they're like, oh, and I'm like, no, it's OK. There's no uranium on our BLM. So the Clintons and the Obamas don't need to kill the ranchers to get it. So that's, yeah. you know, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, but to, yeah, all of the, like all of the, the big ranches in Wyoming are, they have, you know, whether they're 10,000, 50,000, 28,000 acres or whatever, they're all surrounded by 250,000 acres of BLM. And what they do is they just move the herds around and you know, they they brand the cattle, they move them out onto the BLM, and they just move them around all summer long. Yeah. Uh, and then what they're doing on their land that they own is they're irrigating, and they're they're growing hay. They're you know, so they're on the land that they own. Rather than wasting their land, and it's a smart thing if you think about it as a business person, you say, well, we could take that fifty acres and let the cattle graze on it all summer, or we could push the cattle over into the BLM and take that 50 acres and grow alfalfa on it and get one or two, you know, if we're lucky, maybe three, I don't know how many cuttings they get in Ohio. We would always get three cuttings a year. Um, and that's, like that's, that's, that's hate, that's hate year. talk for you guys out there and do don't know. Um, and so that, you know, so they're, they're making the most of that land of that fertile land. They're like, we're not going to put the cows on that. We're, you know, we're not going to put the cattle on that. We're going to grow nice green alfalfa. We're going to bail that crap up. And then when it's winter time and we got them all back on the ranch, then we'll give them the round bales. But Todd, you know, you, you're buying it by the ton. When I was, there were no round bales when I lived on a farm. When I lived on a farm in Ohio, everything was square bales. Right. And straw was a buck a bale and hay was $3 a bale. Mm -hmm. We just bought some. And the 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 and we we priced around the average going price if you want to just buy square bales of hay is nine bucks. It's fifteen up here. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's three hundred percent higher than it was when I was coming up. No. Uh, most people aren't going to be looking at you know. I have this plot of land and that plot of land and one of them's backed up to wildlife management area or BLM, you know, that's, that's not most people's concern. You know, those are big landholders. Uh, it's big landholders and it's, yeah. 
I mean, that's a good decision to have to make if you're in that position. But most of the people that that email us or that we end up speaking to on the Growing Resilience podcast, which you can find on a podcatcher near you, um, are people that are have a small have a smaller concern, and they almost people almost always look at, look at too much land. You know, I think I think Todd Todd uh, uh, tells people that they need probably two to five acres if you're in a more brittle area where there's less rain like under 25 inches maybe that's an arbitrary cutoff i'm making maybe you might want 10 acres um but but no matter what no matter what you're looking at you want to be evaluating you know what is the land itself are there steep grades on this land that's that's a big big problem are there steep grades on this land uh, what are the what are the soil types? If you're doing, um, you know, if you're if you're pasturing, or well, if you're pasturing, that really matters. If you are an intensive gardener, you can make your own soil actually, and we don't care so much as long as it's not terribly rocky and um, and the soil is deep. I don't mean good deep soil, just not rocks at eight inches. Yeah, you're not, not sitting on top of exposed inches. bedrock. Uh, and then we're going to be looking at, so we're looking at some very basic things early on. You know, is the plot size right? Are we, you know, we have two to five acres. Can we manage what we're looking what we're what we're looking at? Is the price reasonable? You know, before we bought our property, my wife and I looked at probably over a hundred acres, and I look, I mean, not a hundred acres, a hundred different properties. And after doing that, making notes, I became essentially a. Um, a uh, what an appraiser <laughs> uh-huh. i i knew what the comparables were i could walk onto a property and know what that market should demand in terms of a price for that property after looking at so many uh so i knew the market i had looked at a lot of properties this is a big decision you don't look at three right they're not ford tauruses where they're all identical you have to look at a lot so that you can develop some sort of judgment uh, and then so when i look at the property i'm like what are the grades like what is how is how deep is the soil does it have water do i have access can i secure it those are really the big big chunks and then from then i say okay what are the structures that are on it right now uh do these meet my purposes or do they need to go away uh what what structures would i need that are not here and then maybe the next thing would be well what have they been doing with it you know okay this has got a good road on it it has a water well and a spring and rural water it has natural gas service to it it's five acres the price is reasonable it has a trailer house i don't really want to live in a trailer house but it's on wheels we can live there for a year and we can move it do something different awesome what have they been doing well, maybe maybe it's in Arkansas, and they literally raised 1.2 million chickens a year on it. Okay, there are consequences. It's poisoned with nitrogen. It's an EPA Superfund site, though the EPA doesn't recognize. You know, what have they been doing with it? Oh, they hate it without amending the soil for 15 years, and nothing will grow on it but sage or broom sage if you're in my part of the country. You know, so those are the things that – that I look at when I buy and uh, I bought a place, good roads, good water, um, good soil, a variety of landscapes on it. We have some hillside, we have some pasture, we have some bottom land. I have 56 acres, about 15 to 17 of that is wooded. The rest of it is pasture. It met a lot of my requirements. It had none of the structures on it I needed, and it had almost no fence on it. (sighs) It took me three years to the day from the day I signed at the closing for the purchase of this to complete the fencing on the south part. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and you couldn't find anyone to build fence for you nobody would do it nobody would do it i had to do every bit of it it's 30 <laughs> acres it's close to square thank you uh, <laughs> there was no fence well that's not true there was fence on it 
but it was built. It was put on it in the 30s. It was made out of old drill pipe and woven wire. It had every bird in Rogers County had set on that wire and pooped seeds out all along that wire for almost 100 years. It was full of trees. You know, I had to take a chainsaw and cut a 12 foot lane all the way around the place. Pull the old fence out and put it back. Took three years. And I don't have a job. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was your job was, for three yeah. years you were a full-time fencer you, you know i that, didn't do it full time, but right. but yeah you know, so yeah what do people want to do i i you know something that it's funny that you bring that up but i think humans we just take so much for granted you know when i when i'm we're driving down the highway i look at fences and i think you know especially in our area of the world where it's up down up down up down ravine you know, Creek and stuff. And I see fence line. And in my mind, I'm like human beings. Yeah. Like I think people who live in the city believe that there's like this, like a, a Dr. Seuss fence machine that just goes out and it goes and it goes. Woo, woo, tick, 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 and it just produces fence tick, 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 you know, like drives in a line and it spits fence out the back. Like, no, when you look at these fence lines out here, there were human beings walking and carrying and driving and and putting stuff up all right ladies and gentlemen thank you for being here today thank you for listening louder thank you for being a student of the gun we truly appreciate it thank our uh, sponsors that make this happen uh, follow our good buddies uh, over there at the growing resilience podcast and remember you're a beginner once you're a student for life thanks for staying until the end Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. And remember, you're a beginner once, a student for life.